We're gonna begin a new series today. It's gonna take us a year. And so buckle up, uh, get ready. We're gonna go through the book of Exodus. So if you have your Bibles, or you have a device that has some kind of app on it for the Bible, open up to Exodus chapter one. We'll be in Exodus chapter one this morning. Because we're gonna be in this for such a long time, um, we've created some resources to help. Uh, so on the screen right now, you can take out your phone. You're allowed to uh, use your phone. If you can use your camera app. Uh, if you need somebody to help you, there's a whole student section over here who knows how to do this. <laughs> Come grab one of them. Um, this is called a QR code. I don't know what it stands for, but this is what it is. I get to your camera app. It should be able to scan that uh, picture. If not, you can just go to our website. Uh, but this is a study guide for part one. We're gonna divide Exodus into two parts as we study throughout the year. This will take us all the way through May. Lord willing, we will be at the Passover come Easter Sunday to root us in what actually happened on that day that the grave, the tomb was empty. It was rooted in history. So Lord willing, we're gonna get there at that time. If, if we planned it right and the Lord so, um, so wills, we'll get there at that time. But we're gonna take uh, the first part of the year to get through the first part of Exodus. We'll do something different in the summer and then we're gonna pick up Exodus 2 in the fall. But here's a study guide for you full of discussion questions. If you're in a small group, your small group questions will be in here uh, so you can cheat and get ahead and look really smart in front of your small group leader. There's also a reading plan. There's a list of resources. Also on our website, there's a link where you can go to a whole webpage full of resources, videos to watch, things to download, books to buy if you want to. Just wanna invite you into the journey of the Exodus with us um, over the next year. On the next slide, you're gonna see a family discipleship guide. So I don't know if you're like me, uh, but you have kids who just need Jesus. They really need him, I mean, big time. Uh, but you don't know how to do that. It's just, it's hard to figure out how do I train them in the way of Jesus? How do we do that? And so we've created just a simple resource for you. It'll take us, this first uh, part will take us through the first 10 weeks of this series. So you can scan this, it'll pull up on your phone. You can actually download it to your phone if you wanna do that. Uh, you can do that and it's right there for you. Just, um, I think, a simple way to disciple our kids. And I love what our, our children's ministry does. I love what Miss Allison does and Miss Natalie does and all the volunteers who helped us serve up there. Uh, but it's lost if we don't echo that back at home. And so this is a great way for you to do it. It's just simple questions you can be asking your kids throughout the week about Exodus and all those types of things. So that's all there. All right? All right, so with that in mind, we're gonna begin our series now through the book of Exodus, starting in Exodus chapter one. Over the past uh, few weeks, um, I've been sick, and so if you could just pray for me, that I'm, I'm gonna make it through. I, I need to make it through this morning. Uh, my voice is weak, I feel weak, and so backstage, Jay asked, is it gonna be a shorter message? And then Joel just laughed, like he knows me better. He's like, no, it'll just be quieter. And so that's, that's what's gonna happen. Um, length will be the same. So we're gonna study today, but I'm, over the past couple of weeks, I've been sick, uh, just trying to get my body back to where I feel like it needs to be, where God needs me to be to continue to lead and pastor and teach. And so, uh, but one thing that happened for me really too late into the game is I decided I was gonna watch all the Marvel movies in order. Anybody, any Marvel fans? Any of you? Yeah. Um, I don't care about it really, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't, I don't. I didn't do the comic book thing growing up. I, um, I didn't. I, I did other things instead. But my kids love it, and they should. And so I, I've watched some from time to time. And so when you watch a Marvel, a Marvel movie, Listen, they're all the same. It's all the same. There's a hero, and he's either scientifically engineered or he's just loaded and can make himself scientifically engineered. And then he saves the world, but he's got his own problems. It's all the same. So when you watch a Marvel movie, you kind of get, get it. You get the context of it. But what I learned was I was missing a lot. Thanks to Micah Godsey, our middle school pastor. I was missing a lot. I was missing a lot of what's happening. There's like apparently called Easter eggs. I don't know, <laughs> but whatever. Um, and so that's all in the rest of the movie. So I decided I'm gonna Google, how do you watch the Marvel comic universe in order? I'm gonna watch it all. And so I learned this probably, I don't know, day seven of my illness, which is a problem because I really could have done a lot of damage, uh, but I didn't. And so I began watching them in order and good gracious, it opened up a whole world to me of things that I did not know existed. So I'm seeing things, I, do, I don't stop at the credits anymore, I watch the end of the credits, which is a thing. There's things, important things that happen, which feels like a really bad idea. If it's that important, put it in the movie. But they didn't, and so I'm, <coughs> so I'm learning a lot of things as I'm watching the movie. And that's, if you're a Harry Potter fan, it's the same way. If you're a Star Wars nerd fan, whatever, that's the same thing for you. Um, if you're a Falcons fan, you understand. Like, it's just been a whole history, and. You don't understand how bad it is now unless you understand the Chris Chandler days and all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, if you're a Braves fan, you, you understand why this World Series was so significant because we've been through it. And so you understand some, you have to know the context to really understand what's happening. You can get bits and pieces of it, but you miss it. So Exodus is like that. Exodus is a book that um, many of us know a good bit about. You know about uh, the burning bush. You know about the Red Sea. You know about uh, the e Egyptians. You know about Pharaoh. You know about the 10 plagues. We, we know about the 10 commandments. We know about those things, but I don't know that we actually know about those things. Like I'm learning uh, about Iron Man. Like I, you, you gotta know things to know things. And so Exodus is that. The word Exodus simply means the way out. The way out. Genesis is the origin or the beginning. Exodus is the way out. Exodus fits in the first five books of the Old Testament that uh, the Greek word is Pentateuch, which means five books or the five book series. So I don't know if you're into series. I don't know if you have like DVD series like Joseph does, uh, but if you've got a bunch of DVD series or you've, you've read book series, you kind of have to know them in order to understand what's actually happening. This is part of a series. So I wanna give you just a few things for us to understand about scripture before we dive into this. First of all is this. While we have the Bible as one book, it's not just one book, it's a collection of books. It's a collection of what would have been scrolls gathered together and that through the power of the Holy Spirit and through prayer and insightful people have put together what's called the canon of scripture or the scope of the 66 books that we have. The first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, meaning the law, the law of Moses, instructions, or the Pentateuch, are the foundation on which everything is built. It's a five-fold volume. And so we have to understand Genesis in order to get into Exodus. But let's begin in Exodus chapter one. And what the author, which we believe is Moses, has showed us is just in the first seven verses, if you're paying attention, is something brilliant that's happening if we're paying attention. So let's just dive in. Exodus chapter one, verse one. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Now we lose this a bit in translation. Many scholars would tell you the book of Exodus begins with the word and, meaning it's a continuation from Genesis. Now, Genesis is 50 chapters long. I don't have the time today to go through 50 chapters. But it takes us here to now the precipice of Exodus chapter one. And these are the names of the sons of Israel. Throughout Genesis and even into Exodus, Israel and the name Jacob will be used interchangeably. Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, was actually then renamed Israel by God. So when you read the sons of Israel, it could be the nation, but it could also mean specifically this man. These are the names. So just a really exciting way to begin this book. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to a place called Egypt. Now, in the scope of and sequence of the Bible, we already know about Egypt. We know about Egypt because Joseph, the one with the technicolor dream coat, has been in Egypt. And Egypt, and he's in Egypt because remember there was a famine. But before the famine, remember, Joseph was beaten by his brothers and left for dead and then brought into the courts of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he's risen to power. He's interpreting dreams, he's making recipes, he's doing a number of different things. But this is what we know about Egypt. This is important. They're in Egypt. Throughout scripture, you're gonna see a number of big um, places. They're, they're kind of the enemies of the people of God. Egypt is one of the first ones. Egypt is a big deal. So last week when Daryl taught from Matthew chapter two about the wise men, I don't know if you picked up on it later in the story, that God sends Mary, Joseph, and Jesus from Judea and he sends them, or from uh, where they were in Bethlehem and he sends them to Egypt. Because what you're gonna see is if you take the book of Exodus and you lay it over the rest of the story of scripture, it is the story of scripture. It's it. We are continually being set free from Egypt. So they go to Egypt, Jacob, each with his household. Verse two, now these are the sons of Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, and uh, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Circle that, remember this. When they first get into Egypt, there are 70 people. 
Now, 70 just represents probably the men, the direct descendants, men, uh, sons, grandsons, that kind of thing. But 70 of them, when they begin in Egypt, there are 70 of them, 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt, and he's there because he's working for the Pharaoh. Verse six, then Joseph died. Very anticlimactic. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. Verse seven, but the people of Israel were fruitful, circle that word. They increased greatly, they multiplied, circle that word, and they grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled, circle that word, filled with them. Moses is giving us some clues if we're paying attention and if we know the backstory. If you know the backstory, you understand how uh, the Avengers were assembled. This, this is what's happening. We gotta know what's leading into this here. Fruitful, multiplied, and filled. 70 Hebrews, 70 Israelites, now in a place called Egypt, run by a king, the Pharaoh. But over time, Israel grows exceedingly strong. They're fruitful, they multiply, and they fill the earth. Now again, we're gonna spend the bulk of the year in the Old Testament. And the great Winnie Pooh author, A.A. A. Milne, has this quote about the Old Testament. It says, the Old Testament is responsible for more atheism, agnosticism, disbelief, call it what you will, than any book ever written. It has emptied more churches than all the counter attractions of cinema, motorbike, and golf course. What A.A. A. Milne is saying is, the Old Testament hard to read. Anybody amen to that? It's tough. I mean, it's full of this God who just kills people when he wants to. There's murder, there's scandal, there's polygamy, there's, uh, there's dads taking their sons up to a mountain to kill them. Like, it's, it's rough. It's not clean, it's not pretty, and it's confusing. Because if all you know about God is John three sixteen, you don't know God. Even the New Testament is built here. So this Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the first five books are huge for us. But we have to study them as they are meant to be studied. It's not just one book, it's a collection of books. Let me just say this to you real quick too. The Bible is not meant to be a handbook in which you pick and choose what you wanna learn. It's the very word of God. And it's a biography, autobiography about who God is. And we have to study the Bible. We have to know the word of God. It's not a handbook. We don't just read verses, we read scripture. So with that in mind, let's put all of this in context of Exodus. Let's go back to Genesis chapter one. So turn there if you want to, it'll be on the screen. <coughs> Excuse me, at the end of, of the message today, there'll be a slide that comes up with a bunch of, of the scriptures we use today, just so you know what they are. Genesis chapter one, God creates the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is where it begins. And he does so um, over a span of six days. And the sixth day, he creates man and woman. And he says this about them in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Whole other sermon. Verse 28. And God blessed them. Who is God? He's a blessing God. That's what he is. God blessed them and he said to them, pay attention, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Are you paying attention? When Moses begins Exodus chapter one, it's not a coincidence that he uses these three words again. What he is saying is there's a new beginning coming. Because over the course of the book of Genesis, we've gone, we've gone quite the distance from the Garden of Eden to Egypt. And what Moses is reminding us is that but there's a new day. There's a new creation. There's a new beginning happening in Exodus chapter one. So that happens. Everything is as it should be. Everything is very good, God says, at the end of day six. He rests on the Sabbath day, the seventh day. Then Adam and Eve fall into sin. They are deceived by the serpent. They fall into sin and they are separated from right union with God. We are designed for union with God. Sin enters and it fractures it. 
It fractures our souls, fractures relationship, fractures the cosmos. And so now we are desperate to get back into union with God. You'd never say that. You would just say you wanna get rich. You would just say you wanna get married. What you're desperate for is to be back in union with God. So God has to deal with sin. Let's go to Genesis chapter three, verse 15. God curses and he disciplines. Verse 15, he says, I will put enmity, speaking to the serpent, or distance between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So God now has to deal with sin, has to deal with the fracture of what sin has caused, but I want you to notice how he's going to do it. How he's going to do it. Because how he does this is consistent overall with who God is throughout scripture. This is what God does and how he does it. He is remarkably consistent with who he is and what his plan is. God is going to fix what humanity broke and he will do it through a human. He calls this an offspring of woman. Now this very text would be um, clung to as many people look for a Messiah, for a rescuer to come from this very moment on. But God is sending someone. What God is saying is it's gonna be rough, but I'm gonna get you out of it. I'm gonna get you out of this mess. And there's a way in which I will do it. I wanna introduce you to a word um, called deism. Deism is the idea that there is a God and it fits into what's called theism. So theism is the belief that there are higher beings. There, there's a God or number of gods. That's what theism is. Polytheism is the belief that there are more than one God. It would be what the Egyptians would have believed. We as Christians are what's called monotheists. We believe in one God, one true God. But we're not alone as monotheists. There are other monotheists as well. Inside of monotheism, theism as a whole, is another sect called deism. A deist believes that there is a brilliant intellectual creator, a God, but this God has set the world in motion and then has now stepped back from it. And, and, so, and so saying, he's not intimately involved with his creation. That's what a deist believes. A deist believes that God is a creator and that God has a plan, but that God just set that plan in motion and he'll be back to pick him up later. This is what deists believe. It's this belief that there's a brilliant creator God who is uninvolved in the life of his creation. This is deism. So off the bat, let me say this. We are the farthest thing from deists as followers of Jesus. We believe in a God who is annoyingly involved in, the creation, in his creation. Some of us view God as a deist through a deistic lens because that's how our fathers were. They created us, and then they left. They created us. Maybe they didn't leave the house, but they weren't involved with us. They were too busy with work, too busy with um, other aspirations, too busy with alcohol, too busy with drugs, too, whatever. And so what we've done is we've created a God in our, in our likeness, in our image, who is just like that. That's not who God is. God is that dad who wants to be at everything with you all the time. And you're a little bit annoyed because he's cramping your style. Like, come on, dad, like, really? The coaching shorts and the high socks again? Do you have to do that to me here today? God is intimately involved in the life of his creation. But the truth is, if we're honest, it doesn't feel that way all the time, does it? How many of you, by show of hands, would say sometimes you've had seasons in your life when it feels like God is uninvolved in your life? Just raise your hand. Keep it up. Keep it up. And let's just look around. This is us. There are seasons where I, I know, I know God's involved. I know he's intimately involved in my life, but if I'm being honest, it doesn't feel like it sometimes. I wanna know where he is. I wonder why he doesn't hear me. I wanna know why he hasn't intervened. I wanna know why he hasn't shown up. Well, this is the struggle that we're going to walk through in the book of Exodus. If a deist believes that God's not involved, Christianity believes that God has adopted us as sons and daughters, and he's intimately involved in our lives. So this plan, he tells us about in the New Testament, in Romans chapter eight. Paul says it this way, I believe that the present sufferings of this time 
are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed in us. Romans 8, 18 through 21. And he says, the creation longs with eager longing, or waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. But then look at this in verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility. In other words, it was subjected to not producing anything. It was subjected to pain, subjected to um, misery, subjected to it not working, not willingly. In other words, the creation didn't subject itself. It was subjected because of him who subjected it. Who's to him? God. And why did he subject it? In hope, verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage of corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. I say all that to say this. God is intimately involved in your life. You wanna know how I know that he's involved? Because he subjects us to futility in hope. You wanna know why you feel distant from God? You wanna know why things aren't going the way you want them to go? You wanna know why you feel like every effort you have is futile, whether it's in a relationship or it's in your parenting or it's in your marriage or it's at your workplace or the finances. You wanna know why you feel like it's futile? Because God has subjected us to it in hope that we might be set free. This is the method of redemption. The first time the Bible ever mentions the words salvation and redemption are in the book of Exodus. So when God gives the curse in Romans chapter three, he's doing what Paul told us he would always do in Romans chapter eight, and that's that he would subject the world creation to futility in hope. In hope, he's intimately involved. Now he said, I'm gonna send you someone. I'm gonna gonna send an offspring of woman to destroy the serpent. I'm gonna send him. So if you've read any of the book of Genesis, it gets gets weird fast. Gets into like monsters and stone creatures and uh, then there's a flood and then there's uh, Noah who named his son Ham and that's weird. And so all these things happen. So God destroys the earth. That's what he does. I would say he subjected it to futility in hope. So he does. Noah then uh, begins creation again. He and his family, a number of things happen from that point forward. And God then calls a man named Abram. We know him as Abraham. And Abram, like every character in the Bible, has nothing to offer God. In fact, he only has bad things to offer God. But this is what God says to Abram. Genesis chapter 12, this is what's called the Abrahamic covenant, which we're gonna study here. Genesis chapter 12, verse one. And the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. Does that sound familiar? And will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God finds a man named Abram, and he says, hey, I got a plan. I got a plan to rescue everyone. I've got a plan to fix what's been broken, and I wanna use you, Abram. Problem with Abram is that Abram's old, old, old. And he's married to a woman named Sarai. We know her as Sarah, who is also old, old. I don't mean to be offensive, but she's just old. And God says, I'm going to bless the world through your family. And Abraham's, I, I don't have a family. I got nothing. He goes in and tells Sarah, his wife, and Sarah laughs because it doesn't seem right. Well, the journey continues for Abram. He travels with his nephew Lot and picks out some land and a whole thing. But go to Genesis chapter 15. And this is where God finally makes his ultimate covenant. After these things, after Abram rescues Lot, finds some land, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. That should sound familiar. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, oh Lord, what will you give me? For I continue, or I'm still childish. You told me, you gave me a promise, and I haven't seen the fruition. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, saying, is this the best you could do, Eliezer? And Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring. And a member of my households will be my heir. 
Behold, verse four, where the Lord came to him, this man, Eleazar, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And God brought Abram outside and he said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are to, able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now, what we would love is if from that point forward, he goes in, tells Sarah, and then they have a child. And then this child has children. And, and then before Abram dies, there's, there's thousands of little Abrahams running around. I'm one of them and so are you. But that, this is what they would think. This would, would be awesome. You know, at the end of Abraham's life, all he has is a son. That's all he has. Two sons, but one through his wife. That's it. He hasn't seen anything. He's holding on to a promise that he hasn't seen come to fruition yet. But notice the promise God makes. Through you, Abraham, there will be so many of us you won't even be able to count them. Well, then how is God gonna get there? How is he gonna get from Abraham and Isaac to where they're increasing greatly in Egypt? How, how will God get him there? Well, it's not the way that you would think he would get him there. It's not through prosperity. It's not through health. It's not through great success. How does God fulfill his promises? by subjecting creation to futility in hope. That's how. And that is how God will always work, is what he has always done. So a number of years pass. Abraham has sons. One of his sons named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, one of which whose name is Joseph. Joseph's brothers try to beat him. They don't like him. He's his father's favorite. Leave him for dead. He is essentially adopted by the Pharaoh and taken into Egypt. And as God would have it, a famine would strike the people of God and the only place to run for food would be Egypt. And wouldn't you know it, God already had his man in Egypt. So Jacob brings his family and his sons. How many of them? 70 of them to Egypt. Joseph is already there. So then how do we get from the 70 Israelites in Egypt to where they're increasing and they're multiplying and filling the earth. How do we get there? We get there through slavery. We get there through pain and we get there through suffering. That's how we get there. It's almost as if God subjected creation to futility in hope that they might be set free. Listen, God is intimately involved in your life. He's intimately involved in my life. How does he do it? He does it the way Romans 8 told us that he does. Let's go back to Exodus chapter one. Look at verse five. All of the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. And Joseph was already in Egypt. And then Joseph died, all his brothers in that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful, Genesis one. They multiplied, Genesis one. They grew exceedingly strong that the land was filled with them, Genesis 1. How fruitful? How much multiplication? How filled was the land? Well, Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. When they finally are set free, the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Because God is faithful. Because God does what he says he will do. How does he do it? He subjects his creation to futility and hope. And he's faithful. Just 600,000 men, many scholars would tell you it's probably close to 2.5 million people. And you wonder why the Egyptians were scared of the Israelites? Verse 40, the time the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. So God moved us from 70 people in Exodus 1 to the maybe 2.5, 3 million people in Exodus chapter 12. Over a period of 430 years of slavery, he got them there. 430 years of pain and trial, 430 years of darkness, 430 years of increasing workload. 430 years. And then we wonder, we wonder why people don't keep following Jesus. If this is God's plan, 
But this is what he does. What do we do with it? Pastor in Texas, Matt Chandler, says it this way. Life in a Genesis 3 world means that we must trust that God has a plan and that his plan is good. How do we do it? How, how, how do we allow ourselves to be subjected to futility in hope that we might find freedom? There's freedom coming for you. There's freedom for you from your bondage to alcohol, freedom from your bondage to pornography, freedom from your bondage to, uh, to, to whatever it is, uh, relationships, um, codependence, whatever it is, there's freedom for you. But the journey to freedom is a long way home. And God subjects his creation to futility and hope. So what do we do with it? How, how do we cling to the fact that God is good and he has a good plan? How do we, how do we hold on to that? How do we hold on to it? I'm gonna give us three ways. First is this, you have to be honest with yourself. I'm, I'm sick and tired of fake Christians. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of people pretending like everything goes their way when they start to follow Jesus. It doesn't. It's a lie, and you're disappointing people who actually wanna follow Jesus. And following Jesus, Jesus tells us, there will be trial, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Be honest with yourself, and this first is this, be honest about your limitations. You are not God. You can't figure it out. You can't muscle yourself through it, you can't love your way through it, you can't finance your way through it, you can't. You can't figure it out. You're not God. You have limits. You can't keep pressing and trying, learning. If I, if I reach this point, then I'll find peace. No, you won't. If I, get, if I get this level in my company, then I'll finally feel the presence of God. No, you won't. If I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if I get married, if I have kids, no, you won't. Be honest with yourself. Be honest about your limitations. I don't know how many of you have children, but this is what we learn a lot. We learn a lot about 12 and 13 year olds who think they're smarter than their 45 year old parents, aren't they? And you did it too. And we have to remind them sometimes, listen, you're 12, I'm in my 40s. I can handle it. I wonder how many times God feels the same way with us. Listen, you're in your 40s, I'm eternal. I think I got it from here. <laughs> Be honest about yourself. You've got limitations. You can't see it all. You can't know it all. You can't do it all. Be honest about yourself. One thing we tell our kids constantly, particularly our boys, is, hey, listen, you just be their brother. I'll be their dad. You wanna fix everything, son of God, daughter of God? Why don't you just be their brother, be their sister? Let our dad be dad. Be honest about your limitations. Secondly, I would say be honest with the Bible. We've gotta be honest with scripture. It's not a handbook. It's not a fairy tale. This is why we're so passionate about doing what we do on Sundays, about teaching the Bible. I don't care to teach you a series of five easy steps. I don't care. Go get a magazine. We wanna teach the Bible, we wanna teach it in context. We wanna, we wanna teach the word of God's passion. That's why, that's why we wanna do this for us. Not because we think we have the corner of, on the market on the Bible, because this is what we think we're called to do. And I believe it's what's best for us, I do. I believe you and me knowing the Bible is the best thing for us. The Bible is one unified story. It's written for us, but it's not written to us. It's for us but it's not to us. So you can't just randomly pick a verse and think God says that to you. He, it's not to you, it's for you because it's about God. It's about knowing the character and nature of God. I love right now what our um, child, preschool children's and student ministries are doing. You know they're teaching your children the Bible. They're not teaching them stories. They're teaching them the Bible. Our preschoolers throughout the scope of a year will study the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Our elementary school students are in the midst of a 22-week series right now on the attributes of God. Our middle schoolers just studied the book of James last fall. Our high schoolers are in the book of Acts. 
because we love your children and we love them too much to give them pithy moral lessons. Be honest with the Bible. Be honest about what it is. The Bible is messy and it's confusing and it's hard. And it doesn't make sense all the time and there's context around all of it. Which is why this Wednesday night we're launching what's called our core class of Christian story. Because I desperately want us to be honest about what the Bible is and what it is not. Because there's been far too many people, far too many books and pastors and um, I don't know, whatever, people. I can't say what I want to say. People. <laughs> abusing the word of God to fit their own means. And it's ruined people's lives. It's ruined families. It's ruined hearts and souls. It's ruined eternity for people. The Bible is God's inspired word breathed to us. We want to be able to study it and study it well and be honest about it. It's hard and it's confusing and it's not pretty and it doesn't mean you get everything you want in the end. Let's be honest about it. Be honest with yourself, be honest with scripture and finally be honest with others. The beauty of church is not that we gather to hear a speech or that we gather to sing songs. The beauty of the church is that we gather to be with each other. Worshiping the Lord. And what's beautiful about that is that this should be the one place on the planet you can be honest. But what's awful is it's become the one place on the planet you better not be honest. You can be honest with others. So first, I would say this. Be honest about your struggles. Be honest that you don't understand something in Scripture. Be honest that you don't know where to find Leviticus. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to fake it till you make it. Be honest that you're not real sure that you know um, who Jesus is. Be honest. Secondly, can we please be honest about our stories? It's like every testimony becomes this big fish story. No, it's not. You gave your life to Jesus. And for a few weeks, you felt really content and at peace. And then life happened again and you struggled. Quit telling the lie and trying to suck somebody into following a fake Jesus. Be honest about it. I gave my life to Jesus and it was hard for a while. I had to be honest about things. I had to confess a few things. We just need to be honest with each other about it. Because what we've been sold is that God has a great plan for your life and it won't require any suffering. Read the Bible. Freedom comes through suffering. Be honest with others. That's why we have our small groups. And I said, I'm not gonna tell you you have to be in a small group. I just want you to have a group of people who love Jesus and who love you. That's what I want for you and for me. You don't have to do it how we organize it. Do it however you can figure that out. We have discipleship groups, groups of men and women who are studying scripture together on a weekly basis. We just need to share our real story, not some Southern Christianized version of it. Living in a Genesis 3 world means that we must trust that God has a plan and that it is good. And I know that right now, many of us don't feel that way. And I wanna give you permission to say it. It doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel like what he said was going to happen is happening. It doesn't feel like freedom is coming. It doesn't feel like um, redemption and restoration are coming. It doesn't feel that way. I know. It doesn't feel that way for me sometimes too. But I have this. His history can prove there's nothing he can't do. He's faithful and true. And it might take 430 years. And you might die clutching onto a promise that you never saw come to fruition. But he's faithful. He is who he says that he is. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? just so desperately want us to be honest today because you'd never find true freedom without being honest. And I know for many of us, life has been, it's felt like hell. It hasn't felt fair. He hasn't felt present. You feel like you've been uh, seduced and, and deceived by God. 
you got a whole collection of scrolls before you to tell you that's not true. And you've got people in this room who would say, that's not true, I've been there, but it's not true. But you're not going to hear the truth unless you first admit truth. So if you'd be honest today, and you'd raise your hand and say, I'm just not feeling it today. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know that God is good. I don't, I don't know. Would you just raise your hand? No one's looking around, it's just you. Just say, I don't know today. I wanna know, I wanna believe it, but today I'm just not sure. How many of you today would say, no, I, I know that to be true because I've lived it, I'm, I'm in it. You can raise your hand and say, yeah, I believe that to be true. I know God is good. I know he does what he says he will do. Praise the Lord. So what we need is more of you telling the other people what's true about God. Then there are some of us here today who are begging for salvation and you've sought it through so many other means but I wanna tell you how great the grace of God is towards you. That he will subject you to futility and hope that you might be set free. And until you've admitted and faced your futility, you will not find freedom. I don't know if you're here today and say, at the end of my rope, nothing seems to be working, nothing seems to be bringing peace, nothing's making me content, nothing's settling my soul. Maybe this is it, maybe it is Jesus. Would you raise your hand and say, yeah, I wanna, I want it to be Jesus today. I want it to be Jesus. I want to find salvation in him, freedom in him, contentment for my soul in him today. Praise the Lord. Just admit. Admit your futility. Admit that you're a sinner in need of a savior. You aren't it. Believe that Jesus is that savior. He's the one who came to bring you back in right union with the father. And then you gotta live it like he's Lord of your life. You find salvation there. I'm gonna pray, and as I pray, our elders and staff are gonna come forward. If you just need somebody to pray with you today, you don't have to, you don't have to say anything or confess this. I just need you to pray with me. Maybe you need help with something. I wanna invite you to do that. I'm gonna pray, and our elders and staff will come forward. God, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power that's there. And God, I'm sorry for the times that I have not been faithful uh, to you and your text. The times I've tried to sell Christianity, the times I've tried to sell it to myself. God, I'm sorry for the times that I have not been honest about my own inadequacy. And I've thought I could figure it out, I could muscle it up, I could mental it up, I could pay enough. Father, I pray that today you would make us a people who are honest with ourselves and honest about your word and honest with each other. May today be a moment in which we um, leave the past in the past and we push forward into what you have for us. Give us courage and strength through the power of your spirit to do it today. In Jesus' name, amen.